Hey everybody, JD here, and welcome to another special edition of Fish with JD TV. Uh, we're doing that a lot lately because we're going through all this uh, salmon season setting process right now. And tonight, we are going to hear from our man, James Stone. Uh, he's going to tell us the three options that are on the table for salmon season. This is going to include uh, Golden Gate type of salmon, uh, KMZ, Klamath Management Zone, uh, Inland, Sac Valley Rivers, Klamath Trinity Rivers. And uh, so at this point, these are the three options. And then from there, the, these options get voted on. And, and as the general public, you will have a chance to uh, put your two cents in uh, later on this process. But uh, this all just happened today. So this is brand spanking new stuff. You're hearing it here first, folks. And uh, we will try, as we have in the last uh, couple episodes, uh, to get to some comments and questions. So if you have some, no guarantees. Last time, uh, if you can recall, we uh, had technical difficulties, which is kind of a signature thing for me. But uh, uh, down here in the bottom, you have, uh, uh, if you're on Facebook or YouTube, there is a comment section. And uh, you can throw some questions in there, and we will try to get to them. So without further ado, oh, and we also have a special guest appearance tonight from uh, fellow Inland River Guide Bob Spar. So he's going to uh, uh, chime in on some stuff or just sit there and hang out with us, whatever. So we'll uh, we'll get to that. So anyway, without further ado, welcome everybody. Uh, our man on the, on the PFMC, Mr. James Stone, who, by the way, has been working his tail off, people. If if anybody, I'm done. Can, Almost. <laughs> is, is PFMC over now? Oh no! Tomorrow we adopt everything to move forward into the April process. Yeah. So. Okay. I, I thought there was more to come, but you're putting in. I mean, I'll, I'll toot your own horn for you here. You've been putting in crazy hours on this, and uh, this process is a, a bunch of stakeholders. And uh, agencies all kind of trying to put together what the uh, the salmon seasons are going to look like, and and our man here is is kind of running the show now. I mean, I've watched, and I know Bob's watched, and uh, dude, the the data you have in your head is mind boggling, and and I just I just hope, and I know that people can't because they don't see all the stuff you do, all the sacrifices you make for our fisheries that just go unnoticed. It's kind of a thankless deal, but. Uh, I wanted to personally thank you for everything you do, and and hopefully people realize that without your fighting for us, uh, you know, our odds get even slimmer. So, with all that, uh, thanks again, and let's uh, let's just jump into it. So we got three options, as the uh, the little cover slide there showed you, and um, let's uh, let's talk about them. So yeah, well, thank you. I, I've got some of those slides you sent me uh, loaded up. So if you uh, if you want me to pop one of those up, just shout them out, and uh, we'll get them up on the screen. But um, yeah, no problem. Well, thank you for the uh, compliment, and uh, you know, I mean, like we've always said from day one, it's going to take all of us, and uh, we're 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 just excited that we're so strong as uh, an inland fishery organization slash ocean fishery organization. Uh, we've got a lot of members that fish inland, ocean, rivers, guides, rec sport, kids, yep. uh, just so many great things going on with our organization. And I'm just so proud of all of us for every part that we all put in forth. As you all know, it's become a full-time job for me now, um, which is uh, not unintentional. And uh, <laughs> completely, I keep saying, can I uh, get out? Can I, can, I, can I get out next year? <laughs> um we're looking for we're looking for the future. Where are you? Come find me. <laughs> yeah, step right start, up. Start and, and tell them we have you at gunpoint. You're not going anywhere, pal. Yeah. <laughs> we uh, we got a lot of work done, and I I want to thank my fellow SAS members, uh, my board of directors that have been uh, so patiently uh, supportive and uh, very wise with our fisheries. And uh, I just believe that we're taken very seriously now. I think that. Uh, for many years, uh, different sectors uh, didn't have the relationships that we do now. Right. And I think that uh, rec commercial uh, charter is um, has a more solid foundation and a working relationship that we've ever had before. And yeah, uh, I threw the curveball wrench in there this year from an inland organization of asking to raise escapement um, officially yeah, through yeah. the National Marines Fisheries Service to protect our stocks. And I think the initial reaction is that everyone in the ocean was freaked out about that. But as they saw through the process, 
Yep. I wore my PFMC hat correctly and uh, represented the ocean fisheries and fought as hard as all of my fellow members did alongside of them. And uh, we managed to put together three alternatives that uh, we're proud of concerning the restrictions that we had and the impacts of the Klamath that really ultimately decided your seasons. Right. So um, what, what's... I don't know that people know this, but the going back to PFMC Pacific Fisheries Management Council is setting the the seasons for uh, your your ocean fisheries every year, and in this process, until you got on, there was never a river representative on there, correct? No, and technically, I'm not a river representative either. I'm a right. California sport representative, so I represent all sports men and women that are just the average sports men and women, including guides, including yeah. charter boats. Um, yeah. You know, for the, the charter boat has a rec, has a direct uh, representative, John Atkinson from New Ray and Sport Fishing. Right. Um, and Johnny does a great job representing his sector as an official position. But we, re I represent recreational sports men and women, but including guides because we don't have our own sector. But Yes, you're correct. This is the first time there's ever been a position that has gone to an inland fisherman, let alone a position created for our, our position. Yeah, right. Uh, I guess that's what I was trying to say is this is the first time uh, there's been at least a river influence or, or uh, you know, insight to help help the uh, the saltwater guys understand what's going on in the river. And I think these guys have really, from what I've seen, uh, even though you, you kind of spooked them there a little bit with uh, trying to raise uh, the escapement, um, I, from what I can see watching on the Zoom, they, they all really trust and respect you, which is which is great because, I mean, they could see you as the enemy. And, and it's uh, it's really cool. So anyway, before we get too too uh, far off on a tangent, let's uh, let's get down to the nitty gritty. Let's talk some uh, some options here and see what's going on. Yeah, so we uh, we submitted three options today on the council floor, and JD can pop them up, and I can read them to you and let you okay, guys see. Okay, so I have this are. one. It's uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, you're gonna so, have to uh, give us some uh, some parameters here. What we're looking at. So this is kind of how we put the dates in the model, and it's kind of just a real cool process. And I encourage anyone that wants to uh, follow along in April uh, to join us on the Zoom conference because you can do it from home. And you can watch us do this, and it's kind of cool. Uh, it's the first year that we've been able to share screens and be able to model individually, and uh, and it, we just had a great process this year, and it worked out uh, to the best of the ability. So here we go. Starting from the top, alternative one read into the record today was the KMZ starting on June 28th, ending on July 31st with a 20-inch size limit two fish. Uh, alternative one, Fort Bragg is June 28th to October 31st and 20 inch San Francisco, the same season, June 28th to October 31st, 20 inch. And then Monterey, April 3rd to September 30th with a 24 inch throughout the year for Monterey. That's alternative one. So that's one of the options that works with the Klamath impacts, the sack fall abundance, the winter run restrictions. Um, and the California Coastal Chinook restrictions. There's all the restrictions we have to work under these guidelines to shape these seasons to make it even a possibility. But I can officially announce tonight and tomorrow it will be adopted by the PFMC Council um, in the morning. And once it's adopted, it'll be probably posted to the website tomorrow afternoon. And you'll see these dates for alternative one. Mm -hmm. Mo moving down now, hang on one sec james so uh the one is that a one fish limit in that column there is that what negative, that's negative okay. uh, disregard those numbers for your guys's purposes okay gotcha. those, those, are, those are how the computer reads the model so okay never mind reads, go on it reads the model if it's a zero it's chinook if it's a one then it could be a coho fishery on oh, the far okay, line so, so uh it's a two fish limit in all those in in all the alternative one Option one. Correct. Okay. The entire the entire ocean is a two fish limit per day. I guess they've done calculations on the model of the amount of effort that gets created from a one fish limit in the salt, and it, it doesn't substantially uh, create an advantage to 
go to that unless you're literally down to a one month season. Okay. Um, that's the only time it really seems to work best for the ocean and for the businesses and the marinas and everyone else trying to stay in business campgrounds, all that, you know, you know how that yeah, goes up yeah. and down the coast. Yeah. So with, with all of the public input that you get, it seems that that's going to be the most desired alternative. That's what everyone always shoots for is to make alt one the best for all. And that seems to be the best for all. Okay. So going to, to uh, number two here. Yeah. So moving into two and three, you've got to give different alternatives. Like where do you want to shift the time? And you know, the KMZ is really expensive for Klamath impacts and Fort Bragg is less expensive now with the new model change and San Francisco is really expensive. So a lot of you San Francisco fishermen are wondering why you might not have an April and May fishery and even a June fishery this year. The model changed and it got really expensive in San Francisco in July and August. And everyone really in the information meeting in February, all the public that participated, they all asked for uh, to cut the spring fisheries until they have a continuous season. And so following those guidelines from the public, including the charter boat fleet and their representative, they really wanted to see the cuts come straight in the spring when the weather was unpredictable, the fish are unpredictable, and they're not as likely to be right outside the gate or on the beach or, you know, um, just up, up upstream or downstream a little bit, uh, um, either up on the Marin Coast or, uh, you know, down down a little bit. So, uh we you give two different alternatives. So the best. Let me ask can, you. Hold on one sec. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, so you said the climate or the uh, the it's expensive in San Francisco, uh, meaning that the the catch rate on on Klamath fish is too high. Is that what you're referring to? That's correct. And okay. uh, I try not to get too detailed sometimes because yeah. I speak salmon a different way than other people now. <laughs> yeah. Um, the ocean guys in this PFMC process is now a completely different language to us. Um, so when you have Klamath uh, impacts, you know, according to how you're going to hit against the four-year-olds and how you're going to hit against the natural area spawners, the way that that system is managed, it's not managed on an abundance or an escapement like the Sacramento of 122,000. Uh, which the Sacramento escapement is of that 122,000, 22,000 go back to the hatcheries, 100,000 go to the natural areas. Uh, for the Klamath, it's it's managed differently on three, four, and five year olds um, for not for an age uh, based abundance um, and forecasting. And the modeling they use is for natural area spawners, and they manage according to that rather than the amount of hatchery fish that return. Mm -hmm. And so when it gets managed that way in the system, it just it calculates and computes the model differently. Okay. All right. Um, so alternative number three, this should be the most restrictive one, I'm assuming. Generally, that's the way that you normally see it, right? You normally see it as uh, the most liberal and alt one, and then you move towards a more confined season and then a more restrictive season. But it not necessarily isn't all that. As we learned when we started working with the department and the Fishing Game Commission about getting our uh, parameters, our borders into the eyesore, the initial statement of reasoning. And we started working with that member. And then we started working within those guidelines to shape the inland season. Mm -hmm. This is basically just parameters, you guys. That's all this is. And so I think people look too far into it. Like, oh man, if we choose alt two, it's gotta be those dates. No, it doesn't. It's just showing you that's one example of it working. But within the three alternatives, the earliest start date that you see is June 24th for San Francisco, Fort Bragg, or the KMZ is the 26th, yeah. which means that that's the earliest any of those three zones can open. Mm -hmm. Whereas Monterey is going to open April 3rd. As of tomorrow, it will be adopted and then announced by the department probably the next day. Okay. Okay, so um, it looks like the KMZ, Klamath Management Zone, uh, is in the biggest trouble just based on the uh, the looking like they're going to, at best, get about a month or a month and a few days of a season. 
And San Francisco is also just kind of eyeballing this. Uh, they're getting a, uh, a later start, and that's what you were saying based on um, Klamath uh, impacts. And, and Monterey, they they look like they have a pretty decent uh, decent season. Yeah, and, and we're talking with uh, all of my uh, peers and SAS members and public, and uh, I really want to thank all of them. If any of them are watching or see this, um, you know, thank you for all the hard effort that you guys did. Um, and also with the fall fisheries, I, I, you're going to see in the Fort Bragg and San Francisco sector that uh, the consensus was is to be a little bit more cautious. I mean, those seasons can stretch out into November in the fall fisheries, which mm -hmm. are a credit card from September 1st on. Any fish that's caught in the sack that's caught commercial or by wreck, it goes against us next year like a credit card does. So I really appreciate those guys being willing to uh, be a little bit more on the cons uh, conservation side this season mm -hmm. and getting to that uh, October 31st and all the way to October 2nd, uh, possibly being willing to give up a full month of their fishery to make sure that enough fish get back this year. This right. is a new year with the change in the model. And so there's a lot of things that are unpredictable and with your, my, Bob, and many of our members' experience and our thoughts towards next year and thiamine, we're all very concerned. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we got this chart. Is that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to throw this up. This is done by my buddy, George. Uh, I just wanted to uh, put it up. George Bradshaw is the SAS rep for commercial uh, alternate for George Keppen this year. But this is just what some of the math that's involved. And so I just wanted some people to understand kind of like what we're doing. Like you, you basically have a certain amount of impacts, right? And this was on the Klamath. So if you look at Alt 1, 9830, when we were modeling in the middle of this process, we're like, wow, we've got 9830 impacts. But we knew that we had to get down to 7,050. So we knew that we had to reduce, you know, upwards of almost 30 plus percent of our impacts. So that equates to 30 percent of your time. And where do you give up your time? Well, out of those impacts, you get divided normally. And the split there is 31 percent went to Oregon for 3,004 impacts and 69 percent went to California out of the 6826. And then those got split up again between rec and commercial, 71% to commercial, 29% to rec. And so it's our job as, or my job as the rec, I've got to represent all recreational fishermen, discuss with our commercial fleet, what our split is going to be and how many fish we're going to get. And that's how we, that's how we do it. And then we backtrack in the season and see how much it cost for days in May, days in June, days in July, August. And those days have a certain amount of impacts. It could be two, three, or even 10. San Francisco and the KMZ in July are 10 impacts every day. And so if that happens, basically you're, you're burning your impacts as fast as you can. And if you can see that the entire rec community, we ended up settling on less than 1,100 impacts for the recreation. So you can see how much they got cut from these charts, this was just a day and a half ago on March 9th. And so in order to get to our numbers, we have to cut back on our impacts. But I just wanted you guys to see that. You can take yeah. that off the screen now so that people don't get confused. Oops. I uh, kind of uh, switched quickly over to this one. Well, um, so this uh, this was uh, Klamath River Falls Chinook numbers, right? So this is kind of the... Yeah, the this is... This is a great chart that shows the run years from 2011 to 2020, and it shows the ocean sport and everything in the, the September. If you highlight the September column there or uh, run your cursor down at JD, um, that September column straight down, that's your credit card fishery. Um, and same with uh, your ocean, your October to November. So that's how many fish get caught. So last year on the bottom, there were Ocean Sport caught 2,974 fish in October to November. They caught 296 and they total caught 44,000 in the Ocean Sport last year, which 7% were in the fall. Anything after the birth date of, of uh, September 1 is considered fall fisheries, September, October, and November. 
And so the commercial troll there caught 5112 last year in September and 561 in October, November. And so our concerns from an inland guide fish, uh, inland guide uh, majority uh, organization that uh, started in the in the grassroots of Reading and the Sacramento and uh, Feather and American Rivers, we were very concerned about possibly fall fisheries having different impacts than we're used to, just like the model had to get changed for harvest. Um, is it possible that the run timing of our Central Valley fish is coinciding with more impacts than we're used to in the September, October when they're coming through the gate. Mm -hmm. And so that's a discussion that I appreciated my peers being willing to hear. And they allowed me to uh, speak my mind freely and they were willing to listen. And that's as much as I could ever offer advice on something that they would have to give up their own time to go to conservation. And they did. And that's huge. That's that's huge for all of us. And, um, you know, we all have to continue to working like this together if we're going to save salmon for us. We got to raise more fish and we got to get more into spawn and then get a little water for them so that they're OK. Um, but, man, it, it's, it's just great working with the people I have to work with at the SAS and the CDFW staff that works the PFMC. There's four of them. Um, I don't really need to mention their names. You know who you are and I uh, appreciate everything you guys do. You guys burn the candle at both ends with us into the night. I mean, 11, 12 o'clock at night, getting emails at 1, 2, 3 in the morning. These people are working hard and uh, I appreciate you and thank you. So a little shout yeah, out to absolutely. you guys. So, okay. Now, Let's talk a little bit about the impacts of these potential seasons. Now, I don't know if you have the numbers or if you can say yet, but do you have any info on what the in-river um, Klamath Trinity quotas might be and what sort of escapement we're looking at in the in the Sac Valley? Yeah, I mean, this is all on paper, right? So sure. <laughs> Sure. Um, last year on paper, we were going to have 277,000 <laughs> fish, 41,000 for harvest, 233 escaping into the river, and we didn't. And I think, uh, I think 233 did escape to the river. I think, <laughs> yeah, if we drop three zeros, we're yeah. probably we're probably good. Yeah. Um, you know, we have been disputing that number, and uh, uh, you know, I know that a lot of people think we're crazy again, but. Um, this isn't just James talking. You got to remember, I'm on the phone. Hundreds of people, literally hundreds of people are calling me daily. And I apologize if, if you've called me and I haven't got back to you. I really, truly do. Just throw me a text and I'll I'll get to it quicker if I'm on Zoom conference. But um, it's uh, it, I'm trying to get to everyone that I can to, to engage with you as a member of the public and fulfill my role of of doing these things. But yes, I can give you some rough numbers on paper. Okay. Um, you know, the, the harvest model was changed in the way that the fish were harvested. And that's the biggest thing that happened this year. And to give you an example, we inputted or the department inputted last year's salmon season, the 2020 ocean season into the new model okay. that predicted this, you know, 233,000 escapement. And we, they say, we had 137,000. So we were, uh, you know, 96,000 off on the escapement. Plus there was no harvest. So we're missing all those harvest fish that were supposed to come back 30 plus thousand. So anyhow, if we, um, if we look at those, um, if we look at those numbers um, and we look at them this year on paper, mm -hmm. um, the change is about 30,000 fish swing. So the old model read about 94,000 fish. So with last year's season. So that was about 30,000 fish. For the Central um, Valley. For the Central Valley. I mean, that's how big of a difference it was from uh, the old model, which makes you, me, Bob, go, hey, that looks a little bit more realistic. Last year's escapement should have probably been – 100, 94, 97. We kept saying there's not even 100K here all year. There's not 100K here. Right. Um, and no one believed us. But, you know. Um, Our clients did. <laughs> well, I, yeah. 
<laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know why people want to think that we're lying about these types of things. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're trying to be honest and it doesn't help our businesses by being honest, but by being, uh, you know, stewards of the river and, uh, and uh, managers of the resource, we have to. It's, it's our obligation as guides, as sportsmen and women. We have yeah. to step up and fight for the resource for our kids and grandkids for the mm -hmm. sustainability. All right. So, OK, so uh, let's hit the climate. Numbers. Training. <laughs> yeah. So okay. uh, paper numbers, of course, this is nothing official, but uh, what what sort of. Uh, ballpark are we looking for in in river quotas for the Klamath Trinity system? All right, so uh, for the Klamath Trinity system, um, let's see, I texted it to all of you guys and I probably, you know what, I deleted it, so you've got it, go ahead. Uh, I, text, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I texted it to you Trinity guys. I want to say alternative ones like 1221, Alternative two is twelve twenty four. Okay, and, so we're, we're talking 1,200 fish. Yeah, okay. alternative three is like 1,240 or something like that, I think it is. So, yeah, yeah. We're, we're talking 1,225 is probably a good round average. Last year was 1,290. Okay, well, that, that's actually a little better than I expected. Uh, I mean, it's not great, but um, okay. So, let's uh, – you, you ready to uh, answer some questions? Let me just tell you the sack fall escape oh, is right, supposed right, to be yeah. 122,000 okay. um, with uh, all the Klamath restraints on the ocean fisheries. They can't harvest enough sack fish on paper in order to get them. So they actually have fish coming to the river. We call those James fish now as <laughs> our side joke. Yeah. Um, and, and I, they're always appreciated everyone. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and this year they did manage to pass some fish to the river, which is also great for conservation. It also helps ensure that we get to that 122,000, which is all that our letter was basically waking everyone up and making yeah. sure that we realized that, hey, uh, we start making it back people. <laughs> right. We're, we're, we're in trouble and we need, we need to ensure sustainability. So here we go. Uh, the sack escapement on paper, alt one is 131,034 fish. Okay. Alt two is 132,221 and alt three is 128,040. So okay, well, that's above the normal 122. It, it is absolutely. So it leaves some extra fish, uh, you know, five, six percent extra on the table, which yeah. is great for conservation measures. And yeah. I want to commend all of the people again for, you know, managing your own fishery, making enough days on the water so that we can all survive. We all know it's survival mode at this point. Right. And um, and, uh, you know, we're glad that everybody can go fishing. Yep. I think that's really one of the, you're probably your greatest reason or greatest attribute uh, that you bring to the table in this thing is being able to, I think because the ocean fishing really hasn't been terrible the last few years, uh, not, not even close to as terrible as it has been inland. And uh, I think you're able to make that point and, and bring that up to people because if, if you're just out in the ocean, you're probably thinking, Hey, and things are too bad. But you right. see what we see, no no spawners, no fish in the river, and hey, Houston, we got a problem. So uh, anyway, uh, let's uh, let's answer some questions. We'll we'll bring in another uh, celebrity celebrity judge. Now this isn't this isn't American is he, Idol. Is he hanging out in the green room? <laughs> we got uh, Bob Starr live from his couch. Uh, just had dinner, so don't fall asleep on us. Right. <laughs> Bob's been guiding uh, since uh, 1932 in the Sac Valley. Um, he, he looks young for his age, uh, but he brings uh, an awful lot of perspective. He's also a board member uh, of NorCal Guys and Sportsmen's Association and a very valuable member of that. Yeah, we got uh, we got almost 50 comments here or questions. So uh, let's do a lightning round. And Bob, if uh, any of these uh, are in your wheelhouse, feel free. Holy moly, I got to scroll up here. You get okay. all American River and Delta, Bob. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's uh, let's try to keep so we don't keep everybody here till midnight. Uh, let's try to keep these uh, pretty concise. Uh, James Kramer, I hope salmon season is better this year than last. Well, James, it, you know, just based on the escapement maybe being up, it, it could be a little bit. I wouldn't uh, keep your hopes up uh, real high. Uh, here we go, Doug Orr. Thanks for doing this. You bet, Doug. Um, oh, Kenny Jones. Uh, we're not going to say that because he's uh, 
saying talking smack. Um, let's see. Jeff Maui Miller, thanks for all you do. You bet. Uh, well, these are easy. <laughs> Tony Davidson, thanks, guys. Travis Small, thank you for sharing. You got it. Uh, Welcome, Travis. This is this is going good. Uh, Diamond Cashieritz. Sorry if I butchered your name, Diamond. Uh, thank you. Yep. Um, Tommy's watching. Great. Thanks for tuning in, Tommy. Uh, Brad Jacks. Yep. You bet. Okay. Thanks. Keep keep, uh, keep supporting the organization, and we will uh, keep doing what we can. Um, yeah, jo join us at uh, ncgasa.org. You know, that's Hang on. The best I, got, way I to... got that banner somewhere. I just got to find you. it. There yeah, I mean, that's the best way to tell your friends to support us. We it, yeah. we represent numbers. The more people we represent, the stronger we are, the stronger we'll get. You know, uh, we have our lobbyists fighting for us daily. I'm fighting for you daily, and uh, we've got uh, many others. So thank you. Right. Yeah, and, and people ask all the time, hey, what? I want to help fight for the fisheries. I don't know what to do. And and what you just said is the best thing. It's 20 bucks a year to join. And the way that helps, I know it doesn't seem like much, but when James goes into a meeting or we all go into a meeting and we say we represent X number of people, the bigger that number is, the much more, uh, you know, they have to listen to us. If we go in and say, hi, we're, we're members of the Guides Association, we, we represent 210 people, they're like, yeah, next. But if we had 40,000, 50,000, what I mean, everybody who wets a line for salmon really should join this for 20 bucks. I mean, it costs less than, you know, a tray of herring or, you know, some bait or a few quick fish or whatever. And uh, it, your voice really helps. And that's the best thing you can do. And if you want to get more involved, we can certainly uh, use volunteer help and all that. But uh, hit that website down there and um, that, you know, just, just going into a meeting saying we represent all these people carries a lot of clout. So uh, thanks for that, Brad. Um, and speaking of Brad, KMZ Zone has me scared for us Northern Fleet. Well, yeah, um, <laughs> based yeah. on uh, those those. Uh, Brad, if you're doing, if you're doing commercial, uh, you might want to go into Oregon. They have got a pretty look, good looking season in Oregon this year, and it looked like one of the alternatives. I think there's going to be a March fishery for mm. commercial troll up there. So check that out, March twentieth to April thirtieth. Don't quote me. Uh, yeah. But uh, that, that looks interesting, like it okay. used to be in the old days. Cool. Thanks, Brad. Um, let's see. Mr. Guide, when the Klamath and other northern rivers have closures and restrictions, do the tribes have to comply with restrictions? Hashtag Squaw Derby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know who that is. I miss the Squaw Derby. I got I to admit it. <laughs> Squaw Derby, yeah. It's... Uh, it's legendary. Well, maybe with the new chief of fisheries, maybe yeah. we'll be allowed to have it again, but it's the Pike Minnow Derby. Now we've been politically told that we're not allowed to use that word. Um, you know, it's hard for me not to uh, want to, you know, go for a, go for the, uh, the grand uh, salami and get the third consecutive victory. I was denied my chance. Yeah. You know? I think maybe on the Eel River, there could be a chance to do a pike yeah. minnow derby. Yeah. Uh, really good chance because it's considered an invasive species. But on yeah. the sack, feather and American, they're considering them native. And even though we all know that they've spawned out of control right. um, with the dams and everything and the yeah. habitat and droughts. Anyway. Um, um, but uh, the tribes don't have to com uh, comply to anything, right? They can choose. Sometimes they choose to do so. Uh, but they're not under any uh, obligation to, correct? They, 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 the tribes are a sovereign nation. So they're their own nation. So the United States of America has a stake. And then the Yurok tribe has a stake. And the Hoopa tribe has a stake. They are both sovereign nations. So they are equal to the United States of America when it comes to salmon management. Right. Um, although they don't have a commercial troll fleet, uh, they can participate in a commercial troll free, uh, fleet or participate in the ocean wreck. But then once that um, is coming in river, then their nation is allowed to have 50% of the total inland take. Right. So 
if there's, just to make numbers easy, 10,000 fish coming into the river, 5,000 are allocated to the tribes yep. and 5,000 are allocated inland right. the other way. Now, the 5,000 that go to the two tribes, the Yurok and the Hoopa tribe up there, it's an 80-20 split historically. Mm -hmm. However, there's lots of dialogue of that split changing. Sure. Well, you have the Karooks up there too. I'm not sure how they get. Uh, you do. They, they don't have, um, I believe, official uh, 1855 treaty rights, I believe. Oh, okay. Uh, but I believe that they do have uh, MOUs with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, and they're heavily engaged in fisheries, especially the spring run Chinook on mm -hmm. the Klamath. Um, that has been petitioned to be listed through the Fish and Game Commission, which we are heavily watching and engaging. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you, Herb, Brian. And saying to you, Mr. Peckham. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Ken says, is SF same as Sac River? Um, no. No. That's ocean fisheries only mm -hmm. outside of the gate. Anything that comes inland east of Carquinas is going to be, now be decided after April. So we still have a long process. These three alternatives will be printed tomorrow. Then we will have one meeting in March where public will comment on it through CDFW Zoom meetings. And then we will go back to PFMC for a week and we will fine tune the season within these parameters of these three options and make you a final season. And it will be announced about April 12th. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see what else we have. Lonnie, thanks. Thank you for checking in. Uh, here's a here's an interesting question. And uh, don't go too far down the rabbit hole, but uh, <laughs> why don't you close the river to uh, to increase escapement. That, I mean, that seems like a, you know, a logical idea, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, one we don't want, but. So, you know, you got to start um, understanding what it means to river communities. I mean, that's how you have to start um, a cultural, a socioeconomic, um, you know, argument for salmon and lifestyle on people. And that uh, with the state of California is more important than anything. So um, when it comes to that, the communities uh, that are anywhere on a river, which is almost <laughs> all of our Northern California ones, yeah. um, at one time depended on salmon in some form, whether it was you know from the fish itself or from what the nutrients brought their area. Uh, with, with that being said, um, there's a lot of lifestyle of people catching fish in river and a lot of people get seasick and a lot of people uh, don't travel and like to stay within their own communities. And so if they want to stay within their own communities and catch fish, they should have that right at the publicly trusted resource. It is a publicly trusted resource. It's equally spread amongst us all. Mm -hmm. And so they decide on how that works out. So this model that we use allows the ocean to harvest 85% of the total harvest and the in river gets 15% of escapement. So escapement this year is gonna roughly be 130,000. So they add this year 19,000 fish on top of that for our harvest of river. So they're going to allow 150,000 to escape from the ocean. And then after we catch 19,000, we should end up with about 132. I hope that explains why yeah. we shouldn't do that. Yeah, I think that was good. Uh, thanks, Trevor. Great question. Uh, Scott. Scott says, gill nets on the Klamath aren't helping anything, especially when the Indians set the net right after the weirs. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's one of those things that um, really uh, is, there's, you know, they're sovereign nation. They, they are doing what, uh, you know, they, they can do there. So there's not a whole lot that can be done there. Um, let's see, D -d 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 Bradley Miller, something needs to change on the Klamath, fairly a recreational season here. Uh, yeah, agreed. But uh, the the question is is what I guess. Uh, any of you guys got any answers to that, Bob? No, that's a tough one. Yeah, we just need to raise well, escapement. <laughs> we yeah. need to raise yeah. escapement to get numbers back. 
Right. Well, if they don't we, have we, them, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 go, Bob. I was just saying, if we don't have these fish that make it down the river, they don't come back in the river. So we, right. we need more fish to come through the system so we can catch them or they can, you know, have escapement goals. Yep. So people so, yeah, are kind of catching them. I don't know if he's talking inland or if he's talking ocean, but um, ocean, the impacts are crazy. So it's always going to be expensive on the Klamath impacts this year, next year, and probably the following. Um, but until we get that stock rebuilt um, and strong, uh, it's going to be tough in the KMZ inland. You're going to have the same re effects until we get that rebuilt. So yeah. we're, we're a ways off. I'm sorry to tell you that. Yeah, well, we have Klamath dams coming out, which could be great. But the flip side of that is that you're going to change the hatchery program and reduce the amount of fish they uh, put out, which I think is silly initially. I can see ramping it down maybe once things get established upriver in the new habitat. But to shut it down early on makes zero sense to me. So I would expect, Bradley, maybe uh, not anything real hot in the near future. So anyway, thanks for the question. Uh, won't that overlay the Monterey fishery? I assume that's talking about uh, having that extended or not extended, but longer season down there. Uh, what do you yeah. what do you say about that, James? Yeah, it's a great question, and Bob always says it to the Fish and Game Commission. Yeah. You're going to create an effort shift, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Exactly. And people people don't ever understand what that means, no. but we as fishermen and professional guides and charter boat captains. We all know what's going to happen. Yep. I mean, it, it, the guys that are hungry are going to go fish there. The guys right. that aren't hungry are going to stay home and wait for them to show up. Um, right. and, and, and most guys are hungry because we haven't been fishing the We're best hungry by the day. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Uh, that's, that's a really good question. And, and thanks for pointing that out, Jason. Uh, it, it, it won't overload the fishery though, as far as the model says on paper fish. So, you know, I'm, they're well aware that when San Francisco is closed, Monterey's open, the effort does shift and the impacts do increase. So okay. they uh, are aware of it. So they're factoring that in. Okay. That's good. Uh, swinging dirty rods TV. Oh my god, it's all bunched together. I can't read it. Sorry. Uh, how's it going, guys? Tune in from Sacramento. Uh, very nice. Thanks for tuning in. We appreciate it. Uh, this just shows with all these people tuning in how much salmon mean to people, you know, and that's the frustrating part that we know that. Uh, you guys all know it, but a lot of the people in the decision making process don't seem to know that. Um, won't be much fish down that way anyway, says Scott. Scott, I assume down in Monterey. Um, I I don't know. Unless it was like 2019 when all the fish were down there. Moro Bay, Santa Barbara, Monterey, pounding on them. But then yeah. they all came back with thiamine deficiency mm. from too many anchovies. So Not one thing is the next. <laughs> yeah. Matthew Davidson, thanks, James and JD. Pleasure to see you guys out here fighting. You bet, Matthew. Uh, again, if you're not part of the organization, uh Sign up so uh, we can keep fighting. We really appreciate all your support. Um, okay, next question. We'll just keep rocking through these. Uh, you guys are coming up with some good stuff here. Uh, Jason says, we are going to have three months of northern fishermen fishing the Monterey Zone instead of only one month. Uh, yeah, we yeah we just, uh, that's kind of, the we just answered that. But uh, on paper, apparently, no, but I, I have to believe that in reality, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Let me let me just say something. Just I know guys don't get this, and uh, please in April, uh, come join us at the PFMC. Just go into the Zoom meeting, and you can follow my screen, and and I'll explain it to the room um, when I when I use the model. And it's is that, uh, the, is that the thing? To yeah, yeah, that's the one for tomorrow, um, the last day. Um, but it's pretty much over, so we're not really doing anything tomorrow. Uh, we'll be on the council floor tomorrow, just adopting seasons, but um, and it'll be finalized. But we, we turned everything in that I showed you. So um, with that being said, I just I, I want guys to get engaged with this season so you can see. Here's Here's an interesting fact. The entire Monterey season from April 3rd to all the way till August, because September's a credit card fishery. So just April to August, the regular season, that whole entire season, as open as it can be, wide open fishing, 
cost 12 Klamath impacts for the entire season. That's it. Wow. Whereas one day in San Francisco in July cost 10 impacts. So those Klamath fish aren't uh, straying too far south. Okay. All right, we got another guest. There he is. Hey, hi. What's okay. up, buddy? <laughs> I, I'm going to be right back. You and Bob talk. Yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, Bob, let's see if we can handle uh, handle this. Let's see. Can we get James's screen off there? No. Uh, what's an impact exactly? Um, I'm not sure. Oh, Brian says he got here late. Um, impact, I assume, is uh, uh, what he's referring to is the, um, the fish that are taken out at sea. Um, let's see. 29% uh, direct, less than 1,100 impacts. Um I'm not sure which one that's referring to. Sorry, James has got all those numbers in his head. Um, they all took an impact this year, though. They all took yeah, oh, hit. yeah. Jeez, I mean, you know, any of us who fished the inland waters uh, really took it in the shorts this year. Mm -hmm. So, um, Jake Martinson checking in from uh, Washington. We all have to sacrifice to fish in the future, up and down the coast, all the way to Alaska. Yeah, that is absolutely true. We are. We've been talking about it this whole process. You know, Bob, we've we've been mentioning how watching this thing, what what the, this setting the seasons is literally carving up the crumbs right now. You know, splitting it up and 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 until we get some some fish back, this is just gonna we're all gonna be taking um, taking hits in the future. And and right now with the way fisheries managers in all these states, the you know from here to Oregon and Washington and back. You know, you talk to those guys up up north and they're having the same issues. I mean, not exactly because we have, you know, the, the lack of water and that kind of stuff. But they're having the, you know, the shift from hatchery fish to wild fish that aren't there and, and all that stuff. And uh, we're all in the same boat. And, yeah, you're exactly right, Jake. We're going to we're all going to be taking uh, taking hits here for a while until we can get this thing turned around. So uh, anyway, thanks for checking in, checking in, Jake. Um Fed should pay the Yurok and Hoop tribe to stop fishing for a few years or cut the amount of fishing days dramatically. That has been discussed. Um, and I know when uh, California first legalized casinos, you know, Indian casinos, um, I thought I read somewhere that that was one of the um, potential stipulations that, hey, we're, we'll let you run these casinos, but uh, no more fishing. But um, I, I guess that didn't work out. So. Um, the problem with that is, uh, yes, you're gonna you're gonna increase the amount of fish to come back, but you're also taking away a uh, you know a cultural uh, fishery for these people, and it's it's not as simple as it sounds. I've, I spent a lot of time up on the uh, Hoopa and Yurok reservations and and hanging out with these folks, and you know they're just kind of hanging on by the skin of their teeth, and those fish really mean a lot to them. Yes, I'd like to see the impact. <laughs> be less on on the fisheries because um some of those fisheries are really destructive but um it's i don't think it's that easy um uh, i don't know so anyway um thanks for that martin james kramer what was your first gas powered boat and how long was it oh geez uh, <laughs> that one came out of left field on that one uh, uh, yeah yeah uh, <laughs> Zodiac. Zodiac. Bob? Oh, God. Well, I put a motor on my drift boat. Okay, there you go. So 16 foot would probably be your uh, answer. Yeah, exactly. I had a, a, a 10, uh, no, 12 foot um, Sears Game Fisher fiberglass tri hull. And uh, I got it for Christmas one year. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Ken says, don't release during fall stripe run. Um, I think you're talking about releasing uh, juvenile uh, salmonids, and it's actually worse during the spring. That's when they do most of the the releasing. And uh, we've and James, you can speak more to this. And, and Bob and I were just talking about this the other day because he caught uh, some uh, stripers with uh, with some smolt in them. And and what yeah, we but, as the guides association have been fighting for um, is saying, hey, you guys, to to CDFW saying, hey, look we're on the river every day. We, you know, our job in the spring is to catch striped bass. So uh, we're inherently kind of know where the schools are. And, and when we hear about a, a salmon release or a steelhead release coming up and you're going to release them right above where we know these big balls of striped bass are, um, we, 
we would like to maybe be able to have a little more open dialogue about that. And we have gotten them to switch a little bit, but then other times like Bob, you warned them a couple of years ago on a certain spot and said, you can't release them there. And then we find out that basically none of those fish came back at all because they all got eaten. So plan a um, plan B was devastating. Uh, yeah. Tell your story, Bob. It's better than. So what happened was three years ago, we had a big, uh, a release at Elkhorn boat launch, a million fish. Those fish took about a week to get down below the American river. Yeah. The water was uh, so low. Boat, there's no current. If I recall, there's no current. All we're dealing yeah. with is tides. So those fish yeah. are really backed up. They're not moving fast. We get a release from the American river plant a and plant B a week later. And it took no time for these stripers to find them literally no yeah. time. And you know, we warned them. I warned him. Yeah. I had a yeah. nice conversation. Yeah. I showed him video, showed him contents of the stomachs of the stripers. Um, there was no denying what was happening. And they said they had no data to prove that that would happen. Yeah. And that we'll find out in three years. But well, we, found, we out. found out. Yeah, we this did. Plant A and plant B did not make it. All you had to do was sit there and get onto some of those topwater bites that we did to uh, see that, that oh. plant, those weren't going to make it. And, and that's where... Um, I, I think we, as the sporting and guiding public, since we have so many eyes and ears out on the water that we're a huge resource. I mean, we don't know everything and we're not claiming to know everything, but it would be nice to get to where our, our information, our empirical data, the stuff we see with our eyeballs, uh, gets, you know, at least listened to a little bit. So anyway, okay. Uh, I digress. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Jason, we need to go to a season tag limit in the river system. So like a punch card, like maybe you have up on the, well, there's no, the Klamath and Trinity and the, the Smith have a North coast punch card, but I don't think there's an annual bag on that. I think you can buy, you know, if you fill out your card, you can buy another card. So what he's suggesting is like maybe Alaska where, you know, you can keep where I guide on the toe gag, you can keep one King a day and five annually. And, um, you know, I know you guys, what both of you guys are thinking. So that's not a terrible idea because you think, okay, reduce the harvest. But what happens, Jason, <laughs> is those fish that we don't harvest go to the hatchery and get bonked on the head and not spawned and shipped to Washington. So um, if that weren't happening, and if you don't know anything about that, go to, I don't know if I have a banner for that. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I do. I do. Here we go. Go to YouTube, check out the video that we produced uh, last year unspawned and it'll blow your mind on what's going on with those fish. So that's, that's one reason that, uh, I mean, it, it makes good. It's, it's a, you're on the right track, but unfortunately those fish are getting bonked anyway, without uh, contributing to the spawning population for the most part. You guys agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. So, uh, gosh, so many here. Uh, Corey says, I've lived here on the North coast my whole life. Used to love to fish the eel. I've seen nothing done to help this river. So I'm glad to see someone standing up to try to save our fisheries. Good work. Yes. Uh, the eel, eel we're, doing, we're, we're not doing tons over there, but we're, yeah. we're trying to start advocating more for you guys on the, eel. right. Right. And the, the eel, um, uh, is, is in a, an environmental crisis right now with all the, uh, the weed grows along it. That's the, the biggest issue that initially the the lumber practices of the, the old days where they would just drive a D9 cat, you know, right down the spawning tribs and cut right to the edge of the water. That got all changed. That's what really hurt the eel in the early days. They they kind of tightened up on the logging restrictions, backed the uh, clear cuts off a little bit. Fish started coming back. And then just as that river was kind of rebounding, the uh, the, the weed grows all up and down that drainage have sucked all the creeks dry for the most part and, and, uh, create a lot of, uh, nutrient and fertilizer runoff. And, uh, it's, it's just a whole nother environmental issue. So, uh, we're, we're like James said, we're trying to do some stuff up there, but, um, the eels, you know, it's a, it's a whole nother, uh, another deal. There's going to be a NOAA fisheries um, discussion on the eel coming up here. And uh, our regional program manager, Kenny Priest, will be there and listening. And if I'm not pre-engaged, I'm going to try to join in on part of that conference too. Yeah. 
So Michael came in late and uh, other changes. Yeah, if you just if you just rewind this once it's over, Michael, we put up some graphs and you can look at, at it. But uh, uh, Monterey Bay is uh, looking pretty good season wise length. Uh, so anyway, go back and check that out. Uh, Kurt Wilson, what's up, my man? Gives us a thumbs up from the North Coast. Uh, a lot of North Coast on here. Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah, really cool. Jimmy Walker says dismal. Is that James <laughs> Herbert well, Walker or is that a different Walker? Um, anyway, if that's the – that's Herbert. What's up, my brother? I haven't talked to you in a long time. Okay, Matthew Oliva. Hold on one second. The dismal part, part guys, What's the that? dismal part. The yeah. dismal part might get worse next year, guys. Yeah. It's, it's not looking good for next year. We're going to have to be, you know, crossing our fingers that we have any fish – because of the thymine issues that a lot of people don't understand. Yep. Yep. And going into a drought. Right. Right. That's I mean. So um, Matthew Oliva asks, what are your predictions for inland Sacramento feather season? Hopefully a one fish limit instead of a shorter season, which is everybody wants that he spoke to or one adult, and one Jack. Yeah. The one, when we went to one fish, we fought for, it was one of those things that just kind of hit me. I'm like, when this, process was going on i called james and said hey he was in a meeting i said ask him for jack too i mean uh if if they're not counting jacks or not or concerned with jacks then let's get a jack and and we didn't get it that year um but um so have you heard i mean i know that's that part of the season settings uh, a little ways off but is there any talk about yeah. a one fish or well we're we're still we're premature for inland fisheries and we we just I mean, we used to start talking about those inland fisheries, you know, this time of year. Uh, but we actually asked for a change in the way that that process always works. Once I got on PFMC and I saw the process, I'm like, this just gives us a zero time to even discuss it. Because literally from the time they adopted in the second week of April from the ocean seasons, they were trying to process the inland seasons within three to four days. Remember that? And then they were trying to adopt it in April at the commission. And we were like, we didn't even get a chance to see this until right now. And now you're telling us, take it or leave it. You know, and we were kind of like, ah, oh, we need more time. So the commission graciously accepted our proposal to give us a 30 day window. So now once adopted we have a 30-day window that we work in for inland season so i'll get back to you matthew specifically of what the organization uh, might do or what we might not do we might remain neutral and not engage sometimes we do that um but i think the department is going to recommend a two fish limit inland and it's because that's what they do when there's 122,000 fish mm -hmm. if the if it's considered not overfished, there's 122,000 coming back, which it exceeds that, and there's no restrictions from NOAA, it's a two fish limit normally. Now there's some conservation measures that have been taken in place by the ocean fisheries, and our board might feel that it's appropriate to recommend a more conservative limit this year to protect our stocks. And if that happens, I would see a one in one or a one uh, fish adult fish limit possibly being a suggestion. So mm -hmm. I, I, I want to say that we're not making that suggestion right now, but that is just all the options on the table. I don't think it would be worse than that. Yeah. And, and you know, when we first had that one fish limit a couple of years ago, we all kind of grumbled at first and it really wasn't that bad. No. Um, and if it's if it's helping, then uh, yeah, I'm with with Matthew on that. We'll 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 go with that. Um, I wouldn't have any problem, and especially if you could get a jack thrown in there too. Um, Steve Carson, senior tuna, says thanks for all your hard work. Thank you, Steve. We appreciate your support. Oh, man, we're gonna throw Mr. Spar under the bus here. <laughs> He's like, oh god, <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> he just turned his computer off. <laughs> oh, he froze. <laughs> Perfect timing. Look at that. Oh, there he's back. James Kramer wants to know how to steal that fish this year. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad as a salmon season. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's been terrible, yeah. James. It's been, or, uh, it's, it's, I assume James is in Sacramento area. So I assume he's talking American, but, uh, American's been awful. And, uh, but you talk to the boys on the coast and steelhead season wasn't very good on the Smith and the yield. They had, you know, some little spikes here and there, but, uh, anyway, uh, Mr. Bocker, 
Thanks for the report on the alternatives. You bet, Dan. Thanks Welcome, Dan. Sorry in. I didn't get back to you the other day. And and Dan, thank you for all the reporting you do. You uh you you for years and years and years kept us apprised uh, apprised of all the all the goings on. And uh, I used to always love the the cold dead steelhead awards or whatever they were called that he used to ever do. Do you remember those things? You'd do like the worst conservation uh, people who did the the worst stuff for fish conservation awards. Um, that, was that was before cell phones, Facebook, all the. All the real, the real time stuff, the 35 millimeter that you had to develop and then send it to Dan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, three color separations for covers and all that. So how can we get the gun GoFundMe started? I had, I don't know if this is the same guy, but uh, guy uh, texted me today or uh, emailed me today and said, "Hey, let's get a GoFundMe started for raising more hatchery fish." And and uh, what I told him, James, was like, I thought that was really cool, outside the box thinking. And even if we raised Eighty trillion dollars. What's the reality of uh, the state and the feds going for that? Well, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, the possibility of a privatized fishery. We know that we would run it better than anything <laughs> because our lives depend on the right. results. So, um, right. you know, I mean, if you if you tell me you, you go to work, you know, you have you know, there just needs to be a merit system. I mean, you know, you you get one hundred and twenty-two thousand, you you don't lose your job. But if you ever go under it, you lose your job. And I bet you we would have three, four, five hundred thousand coming back, and they'd be like, "Sorry, we got to protect our job." You know, and and uh, I just think that that's the way that we've got to start thinking about it. I mean, you know, I mean, we've got to have more at stake to get more fish back, um, but. How realistic is it if we raised a bunch of money, millions of dollars? At, we need 58 million is what I told congressional leaders in D.C. 18 months ago when I traveled there. And as soon as COVID's over, I plan on returning to D.C. with our lobbyist. And uh, maybe we'll make J.D. or Bob go to and wear a suit um, <laughs> and uh, walk You're around right. the Capitol. <laughs> um <laughs> But uh, when we did that last, you know, we recommend a new hatchery on the SAC. It's the only way this fishery is going to survive. We need a set, we need a hatchery on the Sacramento. Maybe we can tag it into the sites reservoir. Maybe we can tie it in with some Southern water contractor help. Um, somebody's got to be able to step up and admit that this is a put and take fishery. Yeah. We need to raise money privately or you know, through the government or DWR or Bureau Reclamation, we have to have a new hatchery, more fish for all. That's the only thing that's going to help everybody. Yep. I wouldn't mind seeing one on the Yuba too, but that's a, for another story. Uh, another time. Uh, Mr. Guy, shameless plug for our Striver Derby. Support us by emerging. <laughs> emerging. Emerging out of your COVID holes and coming out fishing again. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like it. Uh, <laughs> so when's our cyber dairy? Give it, give them, I know it's 10 grand for first place. Yeah, we got a very generous donation of $10,000 for a first place prize. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting system, the way that it works to prevent cheating. So We've had a lot of you call and say, how is this striper derby working? Well, I can tell you there's going to be a lot of variables in there to prevent cheating. Like, uh, you know, I can tell you that male bass only, um, you know, uh, there's no females allowed uh, turned in at our derby. It's all CNR. Uh, there's no big fish uh, at CNR. And there's going to be some interesting ways to win. Um, it's going to be about conservation and fun and fighting for striped bass for the future. It's not about a slaughter fest, about going and trying to kill a bunch of stripers. Yeah. I've had a lot of companies call and everyone's ponying up a lot of great prizes uh, for the winners. Uh, big names in the industry and they're all stepping up and they're all wanting to be um, part of this uh, movement that we've created of guides and fishermen and women and families fighting with companies together. And so uh, the Stripe Bass Derby, April 17th and 18th in Calusa. Sign up now at ncgasa.org. It's going to be huge. We're going to have a DJ. We're going to have barbecues. We're going to have a huge raffle for the kids. Um, we're going to be out there trying to give back to our community and do what we do best. And uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Guide. Mr. Guide. 
Um, okay, let's. Uh, a lot of these are kind of similar questions, so I'll pop uh, pop through them a little bit here. Brian says shared across many groups. Thanks, you guys. You bet. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Um, let's see. I see increased respect for the river anglers of conservation. Yeah, we're trying. We're trying to set a whole new uh, narrative here. Um, so uh, David says thanks for the hard work. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. Matthew Davidson says, been out with James several times over the years, seen the city decline in fish, and he's right. We need to raise more fish and create more habitat. That's right. We need more, <laughs> more, more people saying that. You know, we're uh, getting a lot of uh, habitat created, but we need to, you know, a few changes on that, a few tweaks. I yeah, think you see, a lot. see Matt's picture. He's a new dad, too. Uh, congratulations, buddy. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Cool. New baby um, there. So uh, we got more of these. Questions about uh, yeah, decimating Monterey, uh, if too much effort. Um, Blake, who is one of the first, he, Blake, he probably didn't even know this, but Blake is the guy who made me addicted to uh, river jet boating. I went out with him and we went zipping across these riffles on the sack with my uh, to be wife, you know, and uh, I was like, I got to get me one of these things. <laughs> this is cool <laughs> running and that deep of water. So Blake thinks he created a monster. Thanks, Jack Blake. <laughs> no, no, thanks. Thanks. We appreciate it. Um, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Here we go. Here's a good question from Mr. Maui Miller. Anything brought up about seals? That's a good question. No. Um, um, <laughs> this is a very political topic um, <laughs> in California. Yeah. Um, if you, go so north, cute. <laughs> if you go north, for some reason, they're considered um, uh, invaders of yeah. Oregon and Washington because they are the California sea lion. But uh, if they are in California, they're fully protected. Yeah. They've been protected for years. The numbers were down to like the 60,000 range. They wanted to get it to like 275,000. And now it's like 400 plus thousand and climbing. Go to NOAA Fisheries and you can see all the charts. It's mind boggling and we still haven't uh, yeah. done anything. It's, I, it's know, amazing. I, my, my take on that whole thing has been, yeah, when something's way down like that, yes, you protect it. But now they're, they're higher than almost historical numbers. And what no one seems to be talking about is their primary food source, uh, like salmon, uh, are way down. So your predator prey things way off now. And I don't hear anybody talking about that at all. So, um, you know, we don't want to get in too far in that. we got a bunch of questions. So let's keep, keep let rolling. Me, let me say also that Bob Spar also likes to say that fish and sea lions, they do an effort shift also. So when salmon is not abundant, yep. the sea lions start eating our sturgeon and our striper and right. start attacking our other fish. And yep. we've all witnessed it and we have it on video, yep. uh, you know, hundreds of times. And uh, we've shown it to the department and they just call it natural mortality. That's what they say. And it's, it's, uh, yeah, a little higher than it should be. Uh, Blair Dixon asked, do we have uh, reps from the organization that every meeting? Pretty much. James is at most of them. Uh, Bob and I get to some. Um, there's, there's usually somebody, at every our, meeting we can get to. Our lobbyist is uh, representing us at a lot right. of meetings too. Um, we engage in a lot of different things. On the hunting side, I just was sponsoring a couple of pieces of legislation with the California Waterfowl Association tonight and fighting for your boating fees not to be increased. I mean, there's all sorts of things we do as sportsmen just to help fight for all of us. Right. Uh, this is a good question. EJ24. Two five J, good uh, question. Yeah. So what what say you on that? I guess we don't know yet, but yeah, April April Fishing Game Commission. We should receive a report from uh, possibly the petitioners, the Karuk tribe, and then possibly from the scientists and the department to give an update. They had a twelve month evaluation. COVID hit. Everything got kicked in the gutter. Uh, technically, we should know by now. Um, however, the guidance in December and the eyesore was to follow the previous year. 
which was what the, we recommended as an organization, which was a one fish bag limit starting July 1st to August 15th. And then it became the fall fishery on the Klamath. And I believe that's the way that it's looking forward unless the department comes back in April and says the fish is warranted of listing. And then I would see a possible emergency action of a closure on the Klamath for the spring run. If that happens, we're in a lot more trouble because then that's going to be one more factor next year that's going to constrain the ocean. Right, right. Um, Bob, I know you're with me on this. This dude uh, sitting to uh, the screen next to us has a lot of facts and figures in his head at his disposal. It blows me away. James, <laughs> it just like pulls this stuff out of nowhere. It's pretty, it's like an encyclopedia in there. So I'm, I'm impressed. It's from time spent doing this stuff is what it yeah, is. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> No kidding. No one's got more time. Yeah, I know. James Kramer, is sucker fish invasive in the Sacramento American? No, that's a native fish, James. Uh, those and, and pike minnow are too. Um, let's see what else we got. Thanks, everybody. Um, Good question. Uh, da, da, da. Steve Carson, thank you. That's a nice compliment. Social cultural economic importance of recreational fishing yeah it, it really is and and that's one thing that i'm always talking about when uh when the departments tell us that now we're not going to raise any more fish and you know we're just going to get by with the minimum and and i think isn't there some value especially with covid you look at how many people have been out on the water you know it's been a stressful time for everyone and recreating out on the river has value and, yeah. and not only just economic value to the, you know, rod companies and the hotels and guides and blah, 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 but it has, you know, uh, peace of mind value, whatever you want to call that, you know, it's uh, uh, <laughs> value to your sanity. And that seems, I don't know how you quantify that, but it always seems to be lost to me uh, when, when talking to the, uh, the people that make the decisions. So uh, what needs to change is the later season. Ah, yeah, that's one thing Bob and I have been talking about a lot. Um, uh, because I assume, Aaron, you're talking about the fact that uh, the fisheries seem to be, uh, the runs get later and later. And uh, a lot of times, like say on the American, which closes October 31st, back in the day when Bob and I first started uh, fishing there, uh, you could catch salmon in there in August. <laughs> and, you know, September, fall run fish were there. And now there's hardly a salmon in there by October 31st, and that upper mm -hmm. end closes, right? Oh, it's awful. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, a lot later. Yeah, so everything has shifted, and, and seasons probably need to at some point be uh, adjusted. Um, hey, okay, hold on one second. Yeah, James, James is working on that right now. He has talked to Fishing Game about that for the American in particular. Yeah, we've also James, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, talked about uh, maybe getting the low flow uh, opened at some point again? Yeah, I mean, we're talking about all these options, right? I mean, if the department is going to run and manage the, the fishery on the American and Feather that state that they're just going to keep the hatchery doors open and euthanize these fish, then I'm going to continue to argue for sportsmen and women and children and say those yeah. fish need to be available for harvest then. If you're going to kill them unspawned and ship them, ship them away, they need to be available for the taxpayers and the people that buy your fishing licenses. And you are right. This was the first year of an uptick of fishing licenses um, mm -hmm. in many, many, yeah. many years, many years. Um, so virus, anyway, virus produced. <laughs> it's important. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the Prince of Darkness, Jerry Lampkin has two questions. Is this Klamath spring run fishery staying basically the same as last year? We, we kind of talked about that. You may have tuned in a little bit. I think we answered that question, which is we don't know yet. Um, I missed the projected fall run quota number. Um, uh, Prince of Darkness. Uh, the fall run quota was what, 1,200 or 1,400? 12, like 1,225 to 1,242. Okay. And uh, uh, actually, we didn't talk about the clam. We talked about Trinity Spring Run, but it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. Um, that, that'll be coming out. July 1st, if anything, if you're going to yeah. fish July 1st. We'll know in the Fishing Game Commission in April. April 15th, I believe, is when we'll know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if anything, fishery should be structured in favor of Bay River terminal fisheries. We know where the fish are going and can evaluate impact more accuracy, more accurately. Mixed stocked ocean fisheries are much less accurate. 
Much worse you are. Yeah. Yep. 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 That is, uh, there's some truth to that, Jake. And, and, uh, they've, there's a push to get, uh, some, some terminal fisheries, um, here in the, in the, some of the bays. But our concern is, um, you know, I, I and, and, and don't let me, uh, talk out of line here, James, but I think we would support, uh, wholeheartedly terminal fisheries provided they're not taking fish away from the inland uh, programs to make that happen. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, I sat in multiple meetings uh, with everyone. Um, it started from Dick Poole, um, who runs Water for Fish and is a GSSA board member. Um, he, I mean, the truth of the matter is, is he went down and he lobbied Westlands Water District and others and told them that there was an advantage to having this terminal fishery and mm -hmm. they paid for the science. It was a hundred thousand dollars and they paid for the science bill of a hundred grand and they, uh, came up through Kramer Sciences. I think it was Brad Cavallo did the reports. I was in those meetings in the early, early days of, uh, my, uh, role as the president of our organization. and. Um, I want to say that uh, those fisheries were, we were designing all of the different release points. There was like 18 or 22 spots in the San Francisco Bay. And the number one spot that we all came across was the mouth of the Napa River. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where it was going to be. And uh, the result was that I remember is that A, we can't raise enough fish to produce at our current hatcheries because of the way that we manage them and the way that we utilize what we have. Cause we're raising fish to such a big size. Now we're making these big old juicy bait fish swim down mm -hmm. the swim down the river through the gauntlet now through all the predation. And it's uh, very tough. So with that being said, and our hatchery production numbers going down so much with raising these bigger fish, um, we have, we don't have enough room. Um, to raise more fish. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, good answer. And thanks for the question. That was, uh, however, we support it. If it's a, if it's an enhanced fishery, we get circular tanks or something else. Yeah. We yeah. support it a hundred percent because if you had a better fishery in the ocean, it would put less strain on the other rivers. Sure. And so ideally it, it would be better for all to have a huge abundance out there, not to mention the Southern resident killer whales that are ESA listed and hurting. Right. right. Because you know, salmon is life. And I agree <laughs> with that. Um, well, let's, uh, let's, let's try to get everybody out of here in the next 10 minutes or so. So let's, uh, let's do a lightning round. Jay asked, Sporting commercial start at the same time in June. That's what's projected on most of the alternatives now. Yeah. Okay. Where do the Monterey fish go usually? Well, they uh, they're sack fish that head south and uh, swim around out there. Um, winter run swims down there. Winter run our our winter run spend the most time in that Monterey sector. Um, and then Feather River fish spend their time in that Monterey sector, and then sometimes some American fish too. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot. Of, sometimes you'll get late falls down there too. Uh, but a lot of the sack fish historically used to go all the way up and then come to Coos Bay and then come right back down the coast. And that's when the KMZ and Fort Bragg would run into them when they're coming back down past the Klamath. Right. Uh, but the last few years they haven't done that run cycle, so they're. Yeah, the ocean, ocean's changing. Um, this is an interesting question. What about a different direction, like cleaning up the rivers? I see larger marinas, rotting boats, people skiing, the river struggling. Not why not get rid of all that in the water? Well, that's you know the I think more importantly, Brian would be to clean up the the estuary. The delta is such a cesspool anymore, and that's that's the place where these fish are supposed to be uh, rearing as juveniles and then holding on their way back. And the delta's in bad shape. And uh, as as the delta goes, I think the the fisheries go. Um, but uh, cleaning up, I got no problem cleaning up stuff. It's just finding the funds and the manpower and all that. I'm sure. Um, so, uh, okay. Thanks for the question, Brian. Andrew, are they still? Uh, you can answer this one, James. I know uh, this has been a been yeah. A hot I mean, topic. again, yeah. This is uh, this is something that we support if it's extra fish, right? Um, I mean, all, all we're trying to do is get them to raise more fish. So uh, we work with our ocean partners and hopefully try to get more net pens in all of these areas. Bodega got shut down because of environmental reasons. 
Um, so you have environmentalists that are out there that are scared that a hatchery born fish, the same egg that if it was in a river would be born in the river, but the same identical egg. I want to say that again. The same identical egg that would be born in a river is now born in a hatchery and fed for a few weeks and then let go as now all of a sudden alarm bells go off that we're, oh gosh, yeah, we can't, we can't have that thing swim up our creek because if it spawns with our 100% uh, wild Jurassic salmon in our stream, you could pollute the whole gene pool Ooh. and inter, you know, interfect, you know, or, or, or mess up our genetics is what yeah. they say. You know, uh, the big issue I have with that is okay so they were talking about Lagunitas Creek and some of those other little creeks down there which do not have Chinook in them anymore so they're concerned about a hatchery Chinook running up this creek and spawning with what wild coho no it's not ha c c Canucks it's not happening uh they, they spawn at different times Chinook are earlier the coho come in almost you know in the winter time kind of almost like steelhead later in late fall early winter so I don't see what the issue is there but um I don't know. What do I know? I'm just a dumb fishing guide. So um, uh, let's go. Oh, can't miss that one. Tom, Tom's music. Love you guys. We love you too, Tom, and your music. Thank you. Um, how can we get the hatcheries to put out more? Oh, boy. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> money. <laughs> we pay for them. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a can of worms, and we should probably just do a whole one on that sometime. That's uh, If we go down that rabbit hole, uh, it's, oh, man. That's it's a half a million dollars per million at the feather right now. That's what the that's what it costs. Yeah. Well, and and it's not even the issue of money as we've talked about. It's the uh, the, the politics of it all. Um, nice. Thanks, Thank Brad. you, Brad. That's awesome. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, this is kind of what I was saying earlier. In the end, we're trying to deride crumbs. <laughs> yeah. um, and and you, <laughs> Scott, you are dead on with that. Um, and, and, and that's not going to change either, Scott. Right. And that's what we're trying to get to people is that realistically, that's never going to change. So our only option is a put and take fishery. With yeah, that. we, we don't have the, any kind of clout, like the, the people, the water industry people have, uh, they've got the big bucks and, uh, we're, uh, we're hosed in that department. So, uh, good point though, Scott, Michael, get them to release at night. You know, that's a that's a really good one. And, and Bob, you'll remember this. When we went down the McCullamy Hatchery, uh, it was, uh, was it McCullamy? Yeah, I think it was. Um, and one of the things that uh, they do down there is they realize that, you know, you're feeding salmon pellets in a raceway, right? And so those pellets float. So those fish come up and eat them on the surface, which is where they're most vulnerable, right? You'd rather have fish eating down low. Well, and they do it in the broad daylight. So the guys at, at McCullamy, and one of the great things about that place is they everything they do, they're trying to just improve just a little bit. Let's let's save two or three percent of fish over here, and, and we do that over here, and all of a sudden it becomes a big number. And I, I believe it was there where they said, Well, we've we're trying to, you know, we feed them at night now. And the, the feeders are on automatic timers. And we said, Well, why don't they do that at Nimbus and Feather? And, and I said, you know, is it because they don't have timers? Like, no, they have timers there. It's just they don't, they don't do it because this is how we've always done it. But you feed them at night, you get them used to feeding, you know, in in the dark instead of coming to the surface in broad daylight where, you know, any kind of fish could eat them. So uh, you're you're on to something there, Michael and James. Have we uh, ever gotten the any? Anywhere yeah, the Fort, the Fort Baker is released at night. Jimmy Anderson and Johnny uh, Atkinson. Uh, Bill Smith's program on the enhancement fish. They used to come from the feather and uh, that 10,000, you know, that, that, that 1 million fish would come from the feather, which would produce about 10,000 back. Now that program is completely moved to the McCallamy. So this year is the first year, as I keep saying, 33% reduction in hatchery that are coming back this year. So if this model's way off, we're going to be standing there saying, okay, so this is exactly what we told you. Yeah, we, now, we we're wrong. About. We're going to say, okay, we were wrong, but at least we got some fish back. Yeah. But, but I'm telling you, we, we don't think that we're wrong this year. Um, there's been a lot of changes to the way we manage salmon 
on these returning fish in 2021. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Yep. Thanks, Michael. Um, so this is interesting. This is, he's referring to the Nigiri project, uh, the raising salmon out on, on the rice and, and James, you probably are more up to date on that. I, it seems to me, uh, just, just to back people up, um, and give them a little background, the, the Sacramento Valley used to be a giant floodplain before the levees and the dams, the whole Valley pretty much flood flooded. And so out migrating Salmonids would cruise out into these, you know, what are now fields, but just out into the grasslands and grow and feed. And there weren't as many predators out there and they do real well on their way out. So somebody said, Hey, we still have floodplain. It's just behind the levees and rice fields. What if we got the salmon on these and they put them on there and those salmon do really well, but what's, I know they have maybe some plumbing issues as far as getting them back into the river, but what's, what's holding that whole thing up? Yeah. So, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm engaged on it. I mean, I don't talk to Jacob Katz as much as I'd like to, but he's, he's busy with Cal trout and, uh, you know, the California rice commission is now fully engaged on the program and everything. And, uh, you know, I don't want to take anything away from the program at all. Uh, but I will speak to um, our opinion and honest truth. Um, the program is the best possible thing you could do to get fish into areas that food and nutrients grow rapidly, right? I mean, that just is common sense. So they found a way to grow food fast, and that is in shallow, warmer waters in the spring. And so... If you can get fish into those areas, they are going to grow bigger, they're going to be hardier, and they're more than likely going to have a higher survival rate. And I think that all of the studies in the first three years, I think it's the third year now, I know I've seen two years worth of the data in the studies. Bob, you were in a couple of those meetings with me. Mm -hmm. And um, what we saw in the studies were that the survival rate was just through the roof great. And just what a great program to get fish big, right? They kept trying to ask for a million fish. The department wasn't true believers in the program. And so they were only producing, I think, 100,000 fish for them on their programs. And so trying to get fish back when you're only putting 100 fish, 100,000 fish out, you know, on a 1% or less, uh, you know, return rate as adults in three years is really poor. And I know that the return rates were really, really dismal. So with those return rates being so low, it was hard for people to really jump behind it so fast. Now that could be because all of the test sites were in the Southern Yolo area in the rice fields in the Yolo bypass area, which is in the Southern part of the convergence of the feather and the Calusa and, and the Sacramento drainage basin right there. And so when you have that Calusa drain that drains from the 2047 all the way up on the west side um, from where Sites Reservoir will eventually drain into, and you have the Sacramento River and the Feather River all merging down into that s southern basin before it hits Liberty Island, the deep water channel, and then Sacramento main stem, and they all converge into Rio Vista. There seems to be misguidance when they come back. And I don't know what that is because you could we could talk for three hours about uh, geomagnetic pulse that fish feel as they start traveling south. JD, you and I were on that one, weren't That's we? That's right. That's yeah. Right. And uh, that, that was a great presentation from some scientists up north yeah. and uh and then also talking about do they use the imprinting only when they get back close to their natal streams or is it geomagnetic and that might be what's screwing them up returning from those rice field studies is that they're coming back up different areas could be georgiana the mm -hmm. uh, um the uh, deep water channel delta yeah. cross channel excuse me and um, so those those could all be factors of why the fish aren't returning in larger numbers. So I think my initial reaction is maybe we need to do a study from a rice field in the northern valley up by Ord Ben Chico, Hamilton City, which is higher up on the main stem, which allows those fish to get reintroduced above GCID 
mile marker 205, if you will, 211, somewhere up in there. And that will allow them to imprint better on the Sacramento River before hitting the convergence of the Feather and Yolo, which hopefully will better pr prevent better adult return rates. Yeah. Sorry. All right. <laughs> All right. We're going to, uh, we're going to, uh, just grab a few more. We're not going to be able to get to all these. And sorry, peeps, we, you guys are bringing the, the questions hot and heavy and we really appreciate it. Uh, but I don't want to keep everybody here too late. Um, but a uh, couple, couple quick ones here. There's a lot of them that are kind of um, reiterating some of the stuff we've, uh, we've been talking about, but uh, Jeff McDonald all the way from Massachusetts. And you can see the, the picture there is of a feather river salmon that he caught with me approximately 92 years ago. Uh, uh, do you guys see a decline in interest in salmon fishing from the non-guide community? Is there more bad years? You know, that's a really good question. And uh, this year, well, this year was COVID. So there was a lot of interest in fishing of any kind, I would say. And and people still love salmon. But um, I tell you, Bob, we were taking pictures of the parking lots this year along the river. And... Um, you know, after it became pretty apparent that, um, you know, there weren't any fish around, man, the parking lots were empty. Empty. In the middle of October when they yeah. should just be, you know, parking up out on the street and over the levees. And and uh, so, yeah, I, I would say there's definitely a decline in it. Again, the COVID year is kind of, uh, you know, you got to throw that one out. But, um, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, the, the economic impacts for for all the businesses associated with salmon from the uh, the marinas, the gas stations, the restaurants, tackle shops, etc., um, are going to uh, are going to feel about it. Feel it. Um, okay, let's um, let's just jump to a couple others really quick here. Um, da, 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 da. This is a good one. Ah, God, this we're going to get too far down the rabbit hole. I'm just going to run this out there. Um, turn. Why are we turning a blind eye to the Pacific Northwest and their their broodstock? Cause there's a lot of good broodstock programs that are working up there. And I always wonder that too. Uh, do they talk much about that in any of the, the meetings you've been in? Yeah, a few. And uh, we might be able to get a broodstock program started on the Smith to help uh, Rowdy Creek or, or something like that eventually that's going to, you know, help out, you know, better um, to what those guys want up there. And maybe someday on other rivers, you know, possibly rivers to where drift boat guides could carry, um, tanks on their boats like they do on the Chetco and other rivers up on the Oregon coast. Um, you know, it's a long conversation, but I think there's a possibility, but you have to have a director and a chief of fisheries that are really pushing for that. Um, yeah, and, and, that. And, 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 you know, that's, we don't, um, we don't have people in the leadership role right now that like hatchery fish. They yeah. are, Anti-hatchery anti culture, that's for sure, and it's a pipe dream culture. But uh, I'll get off my soapbox. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's just hit a couple more, and then we'll get you guys out of here. But uh, Bob, we're yeah, gonna throw you a bone cool. here since we threw you under the bus. Uh, Steve wants to know when he can go fishing with you. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of fishing you want to do? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he'll he'll make it happen. Give me a you call. know how to get a hold of him. Uh, uh, let's see here. Okay, this one. <sighs> This one's going to kind of, uh, it's a little bit gut wrenching here, but this is, this in a nutshell is why we're all here doing what we do, dominating so much time. Is there any chance for my daughters, two and a half, and my son, who's on the way in July, for them to see a decent salmon fishery? These fish have been my life and it kills me nowadays. I mean, that's, <laughs> any one of us on the screen could have said that same exact thing. Yep. And, and man, it just, it's a tearjerker. Bubba and I mean I don't know what do you guys think I mean I I I I try to be half full but uh, I think I think this is more of what our fisheries looking like right now you know from um, from when I've started to what it is now and the direction our department is headed yeah it's only going to go down from here unless we get some major changes from mm -hmm. the department and the people in the department actually want to see a thriving fishery that's right. the only way it's going to change yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, I hope so, Bubba. I mean, I've got a six and two and a half year old brother, so I'm I'm praying that we're gonna fight and do something. I can tell you that when I read comments like that, uh, if you are out there and you're working for the department and you wonder why sometimes I raise my voice and I'm a little bit passionate, 
it's because of people like Bubba right there who call me and tell me that they're scared that we're not going to have a fishery. So we're hoping they do their job. We're hoping that they change their policies because what they're doing isn't working. So we're going to fight for you. We're going to fight for your unborn kid and we're going to try our best. Thank you yeah. for your support. Yeah. And, and thank you uh, to everybody. We're, we're going <laughs> to, we'll be here all night. Uh, again, so many awesome questions and we can't get to them all. I'm sorry about that, but uh um, we all have, uh, other things that we got to do tonight, but, uh, uh, sure. Appreciate everybody tuning in and, uh, fellas, glad to have you as always. And I guess James, um, the next one we should do probably is, uh, once river seasons kind of get, get set. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. We're going to have the, you know, the March 24th, 25th meeting on the ocean. So you can make comments on those with CDFW and then uh, go back to PFMC, finalize the ocean fishery, and then we'll work on inland seasons. So we'll do another one of these and we'll talk about after April. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about once we know some new things, uh, we have a new chief of fisheries coming in, hopefully uh, soon. Our old chief of fisheries is resigning on April 9th. I had my uh, farewell call with him today for about 45 minutes. Um, explain to him our priorities for the organization for the new chief of fisheries with CDFW and what our organization is working on. And that entails boat limits, striped bass slot limits, sturgeon management, steelhead, salmon, regulatory commitments, um, and many other things that we're working on with the department um, and some of the things that we're engaging on. And uh, he said, I know your number one priority. And I said, tell me the three words. And he said, raise more fish. I said, <laughs> yes, that's right. Raise more fish. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So cool. All right. Well, that was, uh, that was great, guys. Uh, thanks for your input. And thanks to all of you out there in TV land for tuning in. And uh, Actually, nobody really watches TV anymore, I don't think, but uh, internet land. So uh, we will uh, we'll come back to you with another one of these live episodes at some point and uh, give you the give you the latest because obviously people care a hell of a lot about salmon in this state. And, and, and we had people tuning in from, you know, the northwest and the east coast. So a lot of people care about salmon and uh, hopefully hopefully someday this message gets out. So anyway, guys, thanks again. And uh, if you're not a member to uh, join the organization down there at the, the link at the bottom, because that helps us a lot to just keep fighting the fight. And uh, we will, uh, we'll catch you guys uh, soon. Bob, James, thanks as always. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll catch you guys later. Thank you guys. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. Have a good night. Thank you.